Today, I'll be reading from The Black Hand by Chris Blatchford, The Bloody Rise and Redemption of Boxer Enriquez, a Mexican Mob Killer. Chapter 3, Boxer Beginnings. It was a slightly chilly January day in 1973 when a few Mexican Mafia shot callers, Luis Huero Buff Flores and Richard Grumpy Garcia joined a small group of mourners and family members in a Bakersfield cemetery to pay their respects and bury the first mafia icon, Rodolfo Cheyenne Cadena. Most of the other carnales were still locked up in prison and unable to attend their services. The inscription on the gravestone read, Requedo de tu madre y familia. In English, remembered by your mother and and family. The initials M, roughly scratched in the stone beside the commemorative plaque, made it clear that family included his mafia brothers. 130 miles to the south in Cerritos, a new, booming, mostly white, upper middle class suburb that borders Orange and Los Angeles counties, Rene Enriquez was enjoying his favorite Christmas present a brand new set of slot racing cars. He was 10 years old. His mother and brothers often called him Nene, a family nickname that developed from one of his siblings' inability to pronounce Rene. He was a bright, gregarious, normal kid who played army with a G.I. Joe action figure and loved to joke around and be funny. Batman was my hero, Rene recalled with pleasure. And every day after school, I watched my favorite television shows, Speed Racer, Little Rascals, and the Three Stooges. He was the middle son who inherited some of his father's restless ambition, and as a boy, he often led his brothers in the games they played. A year earlier, Rene's father had landed a new job and moved his family into a brand new four-bedroom tracked home in Cerritos, 24 miles southeast of Los Angeles. It was the state's fastest growing city at the time, carved out of a community that just a decade earlier had 400 dairy farms. It had more cows than people. In the 1970s, acres of feedlots gave way to more than 30 tracked housing projects with parks, recreation centers, a regional shopping center, and one of the largest auto malls in the nation. It was not exactly the hood. There were still dairy farms within walking distance of the Enriquez family house. Rene and other kids used to play in the pastures, kicking over cow pies, looking for magnets. In the 1930s and 40s, farmers used to shoot a magnet down the throat of dairy cows to act as a safety device. Occasionally, cows would swallow pieces of broken baling wire that had fallen into piles of hay. The sharp metal pieces could tear up the intestines and kill the cow. On the other hand, the sharp steel wire would stick to a smooth magnet and prevent the cow from being harmed. Sometimes the magnets would work through a cow's three stomachs and end up in a stool, becoming a prized souvenir for neighborhood kids on the lookout for them. We'd spend hours looking for those magnets, remembered Renee. We also looked for pollywogs and baby frogs in Coyote Creek. And there was an urban legend that deadly quicksand lurked beneath the water's surface, so we often stayed on the edges of the creek. Other times, the dairy farmers would pay Rene and his childhood friends with an ice cream, Dixie cup, or pint of chocolate milk for raking dung into a pile or picking up the trash in front of the drive through dairy store. It was a beautiful little area, remembered Rene, and the entire world was right. My biggest concern was the 4th of July, Christmas, Halloween, and my birthday. Chapter 4. Drugs, Dealing, Robbing, and Rebellion Rene started to drink alcohol when he was 13, breaking into a pantry cupboard where his dad kept the liquor. He and Johnny Mancias, a school buddy who lived in the next tract over, poured a combination of Johnny Walker Red, Bacardi Rum, and Kahlua into a tall glass and chugged it down. By then, Rene had already been smoking marijuana for a year. 
A neighborhood character, Becky, five years older, was the famous local head who introduced him to weed. Her parents were old hippies who always placed a big peace sign in blue Christmas lights on the roof of their house during the holidays. She was a tall, blue-eyed, blonde hippie chick who wore cut-off Levi's and a vest, marijuana patches on her shirt, and biker chains looped from her waist to her wallet. She was walking by her house when he heard this feminine voice ask, Hey, you want to smoke? She had some cheap grass. Renee decided, yeah, that's cool. So they went out to the empty field where there was a big hole in the ground and lit up. He got loaded, hung out for a while with Becky, then threw up. Honestly, he didn't much like that first experience with marijuana, but after that, he smoked it on an almost daily basis. So did most of his homeboys. Older gang members would insist that they didn't force the younger ones to imbibe or toke up, but that was a 12 or 13 year old's own choice. But a kid trying to fit in, trying to impress his older, cooler peers, he did it. The Arta homeboys, like so many other gangsters, washed their hands of responsibility for the younger ones. And Renee, just past puberty, had already slipped into a pattern of substance abuse that arguably helped shape who he would become. His second brush with the law wasn't any more spectacular than his first arrest for stealing fireworks from a neighbor's house. He and two 13-year-old friends ditched school and were headed to the house of a girl who had promised them sex. They had already shared some heavy petting, but she was going to go all the way this time. As the three anxious junior high lovers headed down the street, Renee noticed a yard where a new sprinkler system was being installed. He couldn't resist kicking over some of the elevated sprinkler heads just for the hell of it. A neighbor saw him do it and called the police. Rene didn't make it to the end of the block before he was arrested for malicious mischief, counseled, and released. The Enriquez house, one of only a relatively small number in Cerritos, lived in by a minority family, became a meeting point for the gang members. They all lived in nearby Artesia, but the garage at the Enriquez house became a safe place where they'd go and get high. It became part of Arta's turf. It didn't take rival gangsters from Hawaiian Gardens long to figure that out, and twice they came by shooting up the front of the house. The phrase drive-by hadn't been coined yet. They called it going capping. Just pick an enemy gangster, drive by his house, and shoot. Arta always retaliated. Mark, three years older than Renee, also got into a problem with the local drug dealer. He owed the dealer quite a bit of money that he didn't have. And this guy was no punk, and he was going to make Mark pay one way or the other. Mark took the problem to his father, who reacted angrily. This is wrong, son. John wanted to call the police, but Mark and Renee, creatures of a street code that said no cops, begged him not to. Their father eventually relented, agreed to pay off the drug dealer himself, and admonished his sons to never get involved with this guy again. 13-year-old Renee hid in the bathroom with his dad's hunting rifle when the drug dealer showed up to connect. He was ready to shoot him if something went wrong. Afterward, the brothers ignored their father's pleas to stay away from the drug scene. He whooped them a few times when they came home high, but they fended off the blows and went on with their druggy gangster lifestyle. In fact, Rene became a regular user of PCP when he was 14. Not only did he use it, he made it and sold it too. He bought mint leaf by the ounce and kukui dust at the local Safeway supermarket, mixed it up at home, put it on a dry ice and let it crystallize. He sold it to other kids and had a lucrative little business for an eighth grader. PCP is a drug that gives you a stuttering, stupid euphoria. It clearly had an effect on Rene. He would often wake up in a drug-induced daze. He had no idea where he'd been at or what he'd done. It was another great ingredient for self-destructive behavior, and it improved his chances of ending up behind bars. 
Johnny Mencius was a gang member from the Compton Vario Largo who moved into a tract housing complex next to where the Enriquez family lived in Cerritos. He was the only other Mexican-American kid in the immediate area who was Renee's age. The two of them met at school, started drinking together, and became partners in crime. Breaking into local homes, whatever they stole, they would sell on the street or trade for drugs. Johnny's next door neighbors left for vacation and this high school freshman burglary team broke into their house as soon as they left. It was 1976, right before Thanksgiving. Inside, they found a stash of guns, including a 22 caliber pistol, a 38 special, and a 410 22 over and under shotgun. In the garage was an Oldsmobile 98. They got the keys and stole that too. Two skinny little 14 year olds without a driver's license between them are rocking back and forth down the street in this big old boat of a stolen car with holsters and guns strapped to their bodies. They did donuts on the grass in front of Cerritos High School and drove all over town making sure all their homeboys and homegirls got a good look at them in their entire cholo splendor. Then Renee decided to get revenge against the Hawaiian Gardens gang members for shooting up his house earlier. It was broad daylight. Johnny was at the wheel as they drove up to a little corrugated metal shack that served as a teen post and saw two rival gangsters about their age. Boxer was seated on the window ledge, hanging over the top of the car roof with his 38. He shouted, Where are you from? He locked eyes with one of the kids who knew what was about to happen, turned, and took off with his homie. Boxer fired away widely as the two enemies scurried over a nearby fence and escaped, shaken but unharmed. A police report would later confirm that more than a few of the bullets went into the roof of the Oldsmobile. Renee was a kid with a gun. No dirty Harry. Next, they drove by an enemy household, saw a group standing out front, and repeated the same drill. They later heard that a girl was hit in the wrist and Renee thought he winged a couple cholos but never knew for sure. Then they drove into Orange County, robbed $20 from a gas station attendant, dumped the stolen car in an industrial park, and walked home. Renee kept the guns, a bunch of them, and laid them out on his bed to show his little brother John. That's when his father walked into the room. He called to his wife, Call the police. He's got guns. The cops were there within minutes. Renee never moved. My father held me there with his stare. Mr. Enriquez thought it would be good for his wayward son to spend a night in jail. Renee remembered his dad telling the police, take him overnight and scare him. He was sure it was the right thing to do. Sheriff's deputies took Renee to Los Padrinos Juvenile Hall, 10 miles away in Downey. It was scary. 400 juvenile delinquents housed together on a 20-city acre site built in 1957 as Los Angeles County's second reform school. There was constant tension and confrontation between different races and gangs. Renee had more than one fist fight with gang members from other neighborhoods. It was an alien place especially for a kid who had never even been away from home by himself. It wasn't for just one night. He was there for seven weeks awaiting trial. His parents dutifully visited him every weekend and hired a lawyer to defend him in juvenile court. There are no trials in the juvenile justice system, just a hearing before a judge who has the ultimate power to decide what's best for the dependent. His parents were as shocked as Renee when the judge made him a ward of the state and sent him to Boys Republic in Chino's Hills, a sprawling 200-acre self-contained farm and school campus 20 miles northeast of Cerritos. The wards lived in 25 separate cottages, but it was a reform school and offered multidisciplinary treatment for teenagers in need of highly structured supervision. He was combined there for seven months, but was allowed to spend weekends at home with his parents. He hated it. Rene couldn't understand why his dad had called the police in the first place. I thought my father betrayed me. 
He resented his father because of it. On the other hand, John Enriquez didn't understand why his son felt that way. He came from another world, deep in Mexico, where a father's word was law. His son didn't respect that or the simple truth that his father had only been trying to do what he thought was right. The bitterness and distance between them grew. Renee explained every argument we ever had after that. I brought up what I perceived as my dad's betrayal. It became a wedge between us and strained our relationship for years. In the end, reform school only furthered Renee's gang education. I was baptized in jail. My first twist and I handled it okay. His rebellious streak shot off the map as he entered ninth grade at Cerritos High School and again hooked up with his old crime partner, Johnny Mencius, who had spent only one night in jail for their last caper. After all, Rene was the one caught with all the stolen guns. Fresh out of Boys Republic and Broke, Boxer picked up a sawed-off shotgun from some homeboys and recruited Johnny to help him with the robbery. Rene recalled, anytime I needed money badly, I did a robbery. There was a six-foot wall surrounding the tract housing complex where the Mencius family lived, and a hundred yards away was an Arco gas station. The plan was to rob the Arco under the cover of dark at closing time, run the hundred yards, hop the fence, and escape into Johnny's house with the loot. The 15-year-old robbers snuck into the station through an empty mechanic's bay and hid in the back office. They could see the heavyset woman clerk up front collecting the day's cash receipts from a small round safe in the floor. It was late at night when she turned off the lights and there was the sound of doors clicking and locking. The juvenile thieves, shotguns readied, waited to jump the woman as she came to the back office. Ten minutes passed and she never showed. Johnny said, I think we better check. They crawled across the garage floor on their bellies only to find the clerk and the money gone. All the doors shut tight and the alarm system activated. The two robbers were locked inside. Quickly, they took all the cigarettes off the shelf, stuffed them into a bag, and slammed through a door equipped with an emergency escape swing bar. The alarm went off and they ran like hell, scaled the wall, and escaped into Johnny's house. Robberies were always risky. Drug dealing was the steady, easy money. That was the money, explained Boxer. And girls gravitated toward you. Homeboys gravitated toward you because you had things, and I was a hustler in that respect. This was the 1970s, and Renee was barely a teen as he slipped into a free-spirited stoner phase during which he frequently sold and smoked marijuana, but also dropped LSD and sold it and exper any other experimental drug he can get his hands on. With these stoner guys, it was like an all-out 24-hour party, explained Renee. You just got loaded until you couldn't stand it anymore, and you dropped. There were trips to the Colorado River where he partied with and screwed biker babes, hippie chicks, and surfer girls. Girls would have sex with you at the drop of a hat. Sometimes he even traded in his cholo outfit for a Hawaiian surfer shirt, sandals, and jeans. He went to rock concerts and listened to ZZ Top, Peter Frampton, Ted Nugent, Santana, Hart, Led Zeppelin, and Pink Floyd. He stayed out late at night and got up around mid-morning. Whoever had a party, cholos or stoners, Renee was usually there getting high and selling dope. His father more than once caught him high, sat him down in the house and watched him so he couldn't go out. Again, he'd preach, those guys you were hanging out with are no good. A couple of times he hit his son with the belt, hoping to enforce some discipline. He would order him not to leave the house, but Renee would sneak out a bedroom window when no one was looking. He was uncontrollable, and his frustrated father didn't know what to do. His mother was just glad when he was home and off the streets.